Robinson. She is a co-author of the book, Integrated Behavioral Health into the Medical Home, and currently serves as clinical assistant professor and assistant chair of integrated in initiatives at Arizona State University. She's a national expert in the field of integrated behavioral health and is a leading scholar in helping systems integrate physically sustainable IBH practices. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Leslie Manson. Thank you. First, I want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Or should I adjust my mic? Let's see. Can you hear me in the back okay? A little bit more. Okay, hold on. How about now? No? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Let's see. How about now? No? Yes? No? Can you hear me? Now? Microphone guys? Yes? I'm getting mixed signals because I'm on video. Is the microphone okay, everybody? We're good to go. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. So just so you know, I do tend to move around a lot. So I'm going to move around and identify you and pull you out of the crowd to come up here and speak with me today. No, just kidding. Everyone can breathe and eat and relax. But today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the future of healthcare and where we are moving toward and how interprofessional teams are really where the future lies. And hopefully by the end of today, you're going to learn a little bit more about that. And you're hopefully going to walk away with this idea that perhaps you might want to become part of a healthcare team. You'll learn a little bit about how teams operate, some of the essential functions. You'll learn a little bit about integrated care and some of the very specific skills that you can bring toward an interprofessional team in healthcare as well. Okay? So we're going to be reviewing a lot of different aspects today. Okay? So the first piece is really about integration. Okay? And integration is what we would like to say needs to be standard health care. Okay. Has anybody in here heard of integrated care before? Okay, so I see some head nods. Okay. Has anybody heard of what we call integrative care before? Anybody heard of that? Okay. So integrative care is more of this naturopathic care, and it's traditionally just in that realm, where integrated care is about health care services overall, primary care, hospital care, general health care services, but bringing together that interprofessional team. Okay. Just so that we have a clear definition from the beginning. And then we're going to actually dive into the definitions a little bit more um, in a few slides to come. Before I get there, I want to ask you all how many of you are in here are pre med? Okay. Woo, pre med, yay. Okay. How many here are social sciences? Woo, woo, social sciences. Yeah, you all can woo too, yeah. Uh, what about business? No, no business. Okay. <laughs> uh, public health? Woo, public health. Okay, nursing. All right, give it up for nursing. Okay, anybody I'm missing? Health administration. Wow, okay, we need to reach out. Health administration, woo, in the back. All right. It's really important and essential that when we think about healthcare, we think about all the elements, the different types of professions and professional types that can be involved, especially that we don't neglect things like administration, right, and business. Because if you don't know how to run a business, you can't really run a practice very well, right? And healthcare isn't just about a business, but we need to sustain it. We need to keep access running, keep doors open, okay? And we do that be aim by being able to be more efficient and effective with our care. And doing it singularly as a one-person job, it's really hard to do. But in a team, it's much better, right? So one of the key aspects of integrated care and healthcare in general, in the U.S. and across the world, is what we call the triple aim. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement created the triple aim of healthcare. Are many of you already familiar with it? Okay, so it's something kind of new, okay? So the IHI created the triple aim, which the first aim is related to improving population health, improving the health of our population, which makes sense, right? Okay? The second aim, <laughs> something else going on outside. Uh, <laughs> it's about me. They're welcoming me. Thanks, guys. We're in here. Uh, the second aim is related to patient satisfaction, which makes sense too. We want to improve the health of our populations in healthcare, right? And we want to improve the satisfaction of our patients, right? We want to make sure when people leave that you feel satisfied with what you receive, 
Does that make sense for everybody? Makes sense, okay? And then the third aim is that we need to do it and be fiscally sound and mindful, right? We're long past those times where we can put up a shingle and say, you know, it's gonna be $3,000 to walk in this door, right? We need to really be mindful of the cost of care so that we have more access to people, but also at the same time so we can keep our doors open, okay? And have something where it's shared cost. And so cost can also be something where it's tied to the value and the outcomes you receive. Right? If you're going to pay for a service, you want to make sure you get that service that's going to help you. Right? Does that make sense? That's the triple aim of care. So integrated care, that's its foundation. We know that the outcomes of integrated care help to meet the triple aim. And that's what it's focused to do. Now there's something called the quadruple aim, which adds a fourth dimension. Now Boda Hyman and his colleagues researched and went out to many healthcare sites and said, you know, what's the problem with healthcare? What do we all think it is? Okay. And Overwhelmingly, the workforce said, we're tired, we're fatigued, we're overwhelmed. Every day we're asked to see more and more patients. We're asked to do more and more. Not only am I a family physician, I'm the psychologist, I'm the psychiatrist, I'm a specialist, I do dermatology, right? But really I'm not all of those, I'm really just a primary care physician, right? So overarchingly, they would meet different types of medical providers and healthcare providers and find out that they're being overburdened. And so they felt like we need to add this other aspect, which is self-care, or which is this care for our workforce. That if we really want to meet these aims, we need to be protecting our healthcare workforce, and we need to make sure that our healthcare workers are more satisfied. Okay, that we are doing our best to do that. And that's another unique piece of it. Does that make sense for folks too? You all want to go into the healthcare industry at some point, or you're going to be users of the healthcare industry, right? So you want to have great outcomes, you want to be personally satisfied, but at the same time, you want to be fiscally sound when you go in. You don't want to be bankrupt. Number one reason for bankruptcy in the U.S., healthcare, right? But you don't want to have that experience, but at the same time, you also want to make sure your healthcare workers aren't burnt out either, that they're satisfied and you see that. Has anyone been into a healthcare facility and seen folks that maybe personally you thought that they needed help? They were a little burnt out. Anybody seen that? Okay, yeah, I've seen a lot of, yeah. Okay. So we do need to make sure that that happens as well. And integrated care is an answer to that as well. So that's what we call the triple and quadruple A's. So what do we know about healthcare? Okay. So here's just a little cartoon, right? Whoa, way too much information. That's that piece I was just speaking about. More and more, no matter where you go for healthcare services, there's a demand to do and see more things, right? And sometimes it's because as a population, when we finally get access to care, we kind of Give it all, right? I need help with all of these things. Sometimes it's that, okay? And sometimes it's just that we don't have any other way to do it, so this is the only way we know, okay? But overarchingly, there's more and more demands on healthcare. Also overarchingly, the health of our populations is getting worse, okay? Our population, unfortunately, is not becoming significantly more healthy. We're actually having more and more problems with things like chronic comorbid conditions. So comorbidity is now the commonality, meaning more and more people have two conditions at the same time, is what we call comorbidity. Okay. So unfortunately, it's becoming the prominent aspect. And of certain age groups, the aging population, it's actually something that is significantly common. Okay. So when we think about it, the most people are having difficulties with comorbidities. But one piece that we always want to concentrate in is turning things off. Uh -oh. um, this does not have a pointer. One thing that I, we want to point out is with comorbidities and chronic conditions, that chronic diseases share common risk factors which are modifiable. Okay? What that means is in healthcare, we know that if you have multiple chronic conditions, typically they share very specific risk factors. So I'll name one. Okay? Obesity is a risk factor of multiple chronic conditions. So by working with nutrition or exercise, by just changing that one piece, you can actually change the outcome of multiple health diagnoses that someone experiences. Does that make sense? Okay. So by targeting one thing, you can actually make change in a lot of other things. So it's really important that we understand the base level behind the challenges of our population and of healthcare. Okay. So knowing that, you know that there's a large population of folks that have these chronic comorbid conditions. Right. Almost half of all adults have at least one chronic condition, okay? 
And in about 10 years, typically, they're said to have another. That's how it's going. Okay? That's not slowing down. Right? So more and more, there's more demand to experience more of healthcare. At the same time, healthcare costs us lots and lots of money. Okay? It's a huge drain on our system, okay? as far as cost and as far as time. And 80% of dollars are really targeted toward these populations of individuals that are having these chronic comorbid conditions. So when we think about the delivery of healthcare, we really need to target it in a very systematic way to be more efficient and effective. Does this make sense? Okay. So if we're really going to make change with our larger population, we need to be more effective with the healthcare we're delivering. Okay. We need to be efficient with it. When we think about top diagnoses, what you can start to see is, oh, I did it again. Sorry, everybody. You guys seem to start yelling at me for that. <laughs> uh, what we can start to see is there's a lot of behavioral factors when it comes to disease. Okay? Cancer, 50% of cancers can be prevented with lifestyle improvements. Okay? Asthma, most of asthma are not, individuals with asthma are not properly controlled. Okay? Asthma is controlled with behavioral modifications okay, and practices. So when we think about these things, even the World Health Organization says there's a large population of individuals who have diabetes, but there's even a larger population that don't even know it and are at the highest risk. So we need to really be meeting the needs of our population, and we're lacking in that right now. Okay? How many of you are familiar with the U.S. stats and health? Are you familiar with it? No? Do you all feel like we're doing an awesome job in the U.S. with health? No? Okay. So I got an answer there. Uh, but there are solutions. There's ways to improve it. Okay? We know that the costs are skyrocketing. They're ridiculous. Okay? There's also this greater need of what we call behavioral or mental health kind of care in general primary care. And we know underlying most conditions, there is a behavioral component. Okay? And they have a linear relationship, which means when you have one chronic medical health condition, typically you have a behavioral health condition at the same time. So when you have one, you have another. When you have two, you have two. And they go up in the exact same formation. And unfortunately, your costs kind of triple and double on the way up too. When someone has one chronic medical condition and they have a behavioral health condition at the same time, their costs are over 40% more to treat than someone else who doesn't. Okay? And then when they have two, they go up again. Does this make sense? Okay, so everything climbs together. So I'm going to give you an example of that, what that comorbidity may look like in case you're unfamiliar with it. So say you have diabetes. Most commonly, you are going to experience depression. Okay? That's a common comorbidity. Now, you may experience that for a variety of reasons. One is you could be predisposed to experience depression in general as a mental health condition. But two, it may just be the physiology of the disease progression in your body. Because what happens when your blood sugars are un uncontrolled or under control? You get fatigued, tired, you have difficulty thinking, right? What are the symptoms of depression? Fatigue, tired, difficulty thinking, making decisions, right? Okay? When you have diabetes and you choose fast, quick foods, right, to try to get energy. So then you kind of go up and down, right? What happens with depression? You might have these mood swings where you go up and down. Even anger outbursts are tied to diabetes, okay, and the dismanagement of blood sugar regulation. How many people have heard about anger outbursts being tied to depression swings and mood swings, right? Yeah, okay. So very similar. So again, chronic comorbidity, and you see that it has this behavioral aspect. And what we know, common modifiable risk factors. So when you treat either aspect, either the blood sugar and treat the individuals with diabetes to help manage that more effectively, or treat the behavioral components related to behaviors that they're experiencing, okay, you're going to treat the other. Does this make sense? So either way, whichever way you go with treatment, you're actually going to help improve both diseases and aspects of it. Does this make sense for everybody? Okay. We also know that primary care providers are becoming, unfortunately, psychiatric providers. They are the number one prescribers of our, all psychi psychiatric and psychotropic medication in the U.S., including of antipsychotic medications, so more severe medications for mental health conditions. Okay? Most often in primary care, the number one diagnosis at most medical health centers is related to fatigue and depression. 
Okay, so when you pull the top diagnoses at primary care offices of what they treat every single month, typically it is general malaise, fatigue, depression, anxiety. Okay, those are the top diagnoses. So what you're seeing is that individuals are coming in with these behavioral conditions. Okay, that's why they're coming in for healthcare and into your primary care op uh, offices. So here's some other information related to it. In behavioral health and primary care, 45% of completed suicides see the primary care within 30 days. What that means is individuals who are at risk of suicide actually go and seek help first to a primary care physician. They do not often see a specialist or a mental health provider or anyone else, okay? They see a primary care physician. And unfortunately, with that high of a completion number, that means we're not doing a very good job in healthcare, are we? Okay, we're missing this component. Okay, we miss assessment, we miss clarity, and we miss assistance with this. Okay? And that's where it needs to be, is in primary care. Okay? Most individuals going to primary care also are experiencing what we call presenteeism and absenteeism. Now, presenteeism, does anybody know what that is? I'm sure none of you are experiencing it right now. Okay? <laughs> what it is, is when you're at a facility, maybe you're at your job, maybe you're at school, maybe you're in a lecture like this, and in the middle of it, you start to think about, you know, your mom, your relationship, your brother, your sister, a friend, your grocery list, that to-do list of the day, and you start writing it down, right? You're not writing notes, you're writing down your grocery list, right? You go on Facebook, okay? You take your step away, yourself away from what you're supposed to be doing. Does this make sense? And it's a way of kind of trying to keep up with the stressful times that you're engaged in, but it also could be a way to try to cope with what you're experiencing. If you have a lot going on, sometimes we look at Facebook, right? Or Twitter or whatever it is that people do, right? And you just kind of distract cat videos. Uh, I, someone can send me a cat video and I'll be on there for five minutes and be like, what am I doing? It's been five minutes, maybe an hour. What? <laughs> like, I've like done this seen cat videos? So that's what that is, okay? Is that you're actually in the workforce or in a school or doing something, but you're not really there. You're not as efficient or effective for yourself, okay? Absenteeism is when you just don't go in, okay? It gets that bad, the stress level gets that bad, you just don't go. Has anybody ever experienced that? Maybe, maybe, right, okay? So, and it occurs. Number one reason for these are behavioral factors. Depression is a behavioral factor, okay? Stress, is that me? Okay, stress, other factors. So let's talk about this. So when we're in healthcare and you think, now you know a little bit of our patient population in general, most of us, are overwhelmed, stressed. Most of the population is looking at comorbid conditions, whether you have it now or sometime in the near future, right? And once we hit them, we have a higher likelihood to have more, unfortunately, right? So this is our healthcare population. Now, what does a healthcare visit look like? This is kind of a joke, but I'm gonna, sh hopefully in this slide you can read it better. So when you see your doctor of any kind, <laughs> the study was actually done in primary care, but 80% is forgotten of information being taught is forgotten immediately. How many have experienced that? You go in, <laughs> I like didn't even say how many, <gasps> <Yeah. laughs> right? You go in to see your doctor and you're like, yes, and they say something to you and you walk out and you're like, wait, did I ask the question I was meant to ask? You know, like I wrote it down even, I forgot to take out the paper, you know. But 80% is forgotten. That's on average, okay? So 50% of what is remembered is misunderstood. That, that could be for a variety of reasons. Literacy levels, okay, language barriers, numeracy concerns. It could be a variety of reasons for it, but 50% is misunderstood. So only 10% is actually remembered accurately. Thankfully, we don't do this study in your education classes here at the university, right? It would, it would be reversed, right? It'd be reversed, right? 10% is forgotten immediately. 80% is accurate, <laughs> okay? But this is unfortunately very common, okay? So this is the experience, and I think all of you have recognized, you can kind of think back and say, this has maybe been my mind. As much as I work in the healthcare field, I've managed healthcare centers, I can go in to see a primary care and walk out thinking, I didn't ask any of the questions I meant to ask, right? Or they had said something which totally did not make sense to me at all. I didn't ask for clarity, I just went, uh-huh, okay, yes, right? And I just walked out for whatever reason, right? the power differential, cultural concerns, it just happens. But we need to be mindful of this and recognize in healthcare, as a one-person shop, 
it's going to be hard to beat this, right? You're going to have to sit with this patient for a long time to help them to switch these numbers. And that's another reason why we need to start to look at being a team, being more effective with what we're doing. We also need to acknowledge in healthcare that there's just some generalities which are just true, okay? So 80% of folks don't follow change to make their behaviors improve. Now, you can probably all think about that in your own lives. At some point, I'm sure you've all been encouraged to do some sort of change, okay? It could be to eat more healthy, exercise. It could be to put a seatbelt on. Don't speed, okay? I speed every day. No, I don't. Yes, I do, okay? I'm sure of it, okay? Um, it could be anything. I take my vitamins. I'm horrible at it, horrible. I have the bottle literally on my kitchen counter. I bypass it every day, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll take that later. Yeah, the next day. That's later, you know, two days later. That's later. Okay, so 80% of us, including myself, we don't follow advice to change our behaviors. And we wonder why we are where we are regarding our health, right? 50% don't follow long-term medication regimens, and 30% don't complete curative medication regimens. I mean, how many of you have gotten antibiotics and didn't finish it? Come on now. Come, really? Okay. 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 Right? So that's what we're talking about. At the same time, so we have these challenges as a patients, right? We have our challenges with our health and our own behaviors. And at the same time, we really lack access to care. And if you think about this community, this community is fairly rural as well. I'm sure you all recognize that you lack access to care. And there's many populations of folks that lack complete access to care. Okay? In many places across the United States, people have to go drive 11 to more hours just to find a dermatologist or a psychiatrist of any kind. And even then, that doesn't mean their insurance will take them or they'll be able to see them in a timely manner, even if they have more significant diagnoses like cancer. Okay? So we have to recognize that our services are limited and access to care is limited. So what's that solution? I'm sure everyone can hear it, right? Integrated care. What, what? Right? Okay, yeah. You guys are all supposed to go, yes! Right? Okay, by the end of the thing, we'll, we'll practice. So integrated care, linking behavioral health and primary care, and that model of what we call the PCBH model, primary care behavioral health, it helps us to have more effective and efficient care, reducing our costs, improving our outcome, and all being a team to deliver it. Now, integrated care, there's many models for it. I'm going to run through them, so we're not going to actually take a lot of time on them at all, but I want to concentrate on a few different definitions just so people can recognize some things. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about more essential elements related. So there's some definitions of what a primary care provider is. So in primary care, they're responsible for a lot, right? That's, that's like a paragraph. That's a lot there, right? So when we think about it, we really need to look at more systems and systematic coordination where we can have shared responsibilities and teams working together. Okay? The, U, the United States government and the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration and Healthcare Resource Services Administration, <gasps> governments in their, their name, Right? They say, we need the systematic coordination of general and behavioral health care. This needs to be the approach that we provide care to our population. Okay? Along with okay, AHRQ, the World Health Organization, the Institute of Medicine, everyone says the same thing. We need a team-based formation of care. Not just for the U.S., but for around the world. But for us, especially so as well. Due to our, our unfortunately, our unhealthy population is continuing to grow, and our healthcare workforce is not keeping up with our population, okay? We have more and more need for more healthcare work, workforces. Now, the definition is that there's at least two healthcare providers who work collaboratively together. So that's two interprofessional providers, two different types working together, okay? Now, it's great when you can have more than two, but two is a great start. And we need to meet that triple and quadruple aims. Now, you see the shared goals, coordination, high quality care, that seems easy, right? It's a little bit difficult, right? So there's more to it, okay? And one of the major aspects and tenets of these models is to incorporate behavioral health. What we used to call mental health care workers, but now we look at it and say behavioral health. And we need to incorporate them because actually, behavioral health care workers expands mental health, and it goes beyond that. And they work with just general health-related behaviors and behavior change. So it's not just mental health. It's any behavior which impacts your health. What choices you make? When do you choose to eat? What times of the day? What's your schedule look like? Do you do any self-care, right? Do you wear a seatbelt? Do you speed down the road? 
any behaviors at all, okay? And how do you manage your general chronic health conditions, right? Drinking alcohol, smoking, et cetera, okay? So really, we want to look at this term so much more broadly, and we need to be focused. So we need a formalized, shared, and accurate definition of integrated care. That's essential. And that definition needs to be defined what integrated care is, which we're going to say is PCBH. We need the integrated care team defined. I can't tell you how often I've seen integrated care teams, and they forget to incorporate the patient. The patient's not part of their role. Yeah, they're, they're a part, right? We need to incorporate that because that's that 10% that they're really walking away with. We need to flip it. They need to know 80% of the appointment, right? Okay. So they need to be incorporated. We need to have functions of each of the roles, and we need to have knowledge of that, and we need to know everyone's roles and responsibilities in a team. Okay. And that takes time and training. This is a slide that's overwhelming. It just says almost any company, any healthcare resource you can think of says we need to be doing this and supports it. Okay. So aging, pediatrics, everyone says we need to do it. One of the key elements is interprofessional care and resources. Okay? So building interprofessional education means we need to utilize informatics. We need to do evidence-based practice and interventions. We need to have quality improvement. We need to have patient-centered elements. And we need to do it all as a team. And that's a little bit more difficult than just stated. Okay? It takes a lot of practice. And there's very specific competencies so luckily, we don't have to do this blindly. A lot of times in healthcare, you might have classes where you go in and you're like, did the professor just put this together in a minute? Anybody ever experienced that? Or maybe, I, maybe I've put together in a minute. Uh, but we do that in healthcare. We see a need and we just jump. We're like, we're gonna throw that in there. Let's go and do it, okay? We take care of the patient. But we don't do it systematically, and that means we don't do it well. We might not get the best outcomes. So we need to do outcome-based changes. We need to be looking at what are the competencies that are already there, what does the evidence say? So for interprofessional areas, there's values and ethics, roles and responsibilities, teams and teamwork, and interprofessional communication. All of those elements are essential, and they all have learning aspects and training aspects that are required. So you think about teams for a second, right? How many of you have been on sports teams before? Okay, so quite a few. So when you join a sports team, do you all just get together and magically you're a team? No, right? There's a lot of rules, right? So I, I played ice hockey in college, and I got on there and I was like, oh, wait, wait, what do you do? You know, like my rules are totally different than the other. Am I allowed to skate here? I'm not allowed to go past that line, right? But they are, and I have to give them. Wait, I, I can't do that? There's all these rules, right? And you need to know who does what. Because if you don't know what the other person does, you can't function as a team, right? If you're not supposed to shoot, or if you're not supposed to skate past here, you're going to need to make sure that puck gets the person who can't, right? You need to be able to function correctly. And so part of this is the same elements you've got to learn in healthcare, in the healthcare industry. We've got to teach people in those ways. There's also very specific integrated care competencies for our professionals. So they actually can learn, while they're getting licensed, very specific competencies to make sure that they actually learn what to do when they go into an integrated care site. Okay? So while you're in school, you could actually request and look for those things. Okay? You might be in public health or nursing. Okay? You could be in a mental health profession or in primary care or uh, looking at physicians or PA roles. And you can say, I want to get more of those competencies and build them in so that I'm ready to go out there into that workforce and work in a team-based function instead of solely. Okay? So some of the other interprofessional collaboration competencies it's often termed IPE, just so folks know, you hear that term. It's called IPE. One of the pieces are values and ethics, okay? So if you think about it, you're putting these teams of people into a healthcare practice and saying, okay, go see a patient. You're gonna have times where your values and their values do not align. Your ethics may not align, right? We're all personal beings. Okay. We also have different professional legal requirements and ethics that are different. So I'll give one example. For individuals who are on behavioral and mental health license, okay, they do not need to report certain types of injuries, like suspicious injuries, gun wounds, knife wounds, even some domestic violence, they don't report. Okay? They only report in case of the, the adult is compromised in some way, an aging adult or older adult or uh, someone who has other types of disorders, or it could be a child is involved or a child in the home, then they need to. 
But for a, a, a generalized adult, they do not report that. Now for a physician, their ethical code is different. They have to report suspicious injuries, and if they treat wounds related to domestic violence, in most every single state, they're required to report it. Okay? So put that group together. If you don't know those reporting laws, you could be guiding the patient and talking about it and disputing things right there in the room with them. Okay? That can be a big source of tension. Your values or your ethics or your legalities may be different. So it's really important that you have an understanding of that. So one of the base parts of IP is, well, if we're going to build a team, we should talk about values and ethics. We should be open about that. We should get people together. It's kind of like when you have friends, right? You all have friends in here, correct? I hope so, right? Okay. I'm sure at some point with your friends, you've aligned with them because of values and ethics. There's some sort of shared commonality that you recognize. And when you don't recognize it, and when you hit it, right, they voted for this person, you voted for this, or whatever it might have been, right, something occurs. And when that occurs, you kind of talk about it. Well, you should, right? So you try to work it out. Can your value and ethics align even if you have a disagreement or difference? Okay? So working in teams, you've got to be able to figure it out, and you've got to figure out how do you manage that conflict when it occurs. Because trust me, it'll occur. Okay? Especially in healthcare. Life-changing decisions. Okay? Roles and responsibilities. Another IPE competency. Well, you've got to know your role and responsibility. I can't tell you how often I've gone to healthcare centers across the U.S. and I say, okay, great, can you tell me what you do? Right? Well, I see patients. Well, I know that. But can you define it in a way that any patient would understand it? Okay? How is a patient who doesn't know what primary care is going to understand? How is a patient who doesn't know what a mental health practitioner is in primary care going to know what you do? Because oftentimes we'll get scared. You have someone that comes in a room and they're in primary care and a social worker comes in, they could think of a variety of reasons. I'm being reported against, right? Uh, you know, is, is this immigration? There could be lots of concerns that come up. Who is this stranger and why are they here? So ne everyone needs to be able to say their own roles and responsibilities that they can communicate it in a way that most people would understand. And in healthcare, what we look at is at a minimum is at a fourth to fifth grade education level, okay? Third to sixth grade is the national education reading levels and comprehension level of the average adult. So that's what we have to work on. So we need to be able to communicate our own, but then we also need to be able to communicate every other team member's roles and responsibilities. So not only do I need to know how to say what my job is, I need to be able to tell you what the other jobs of the other team members are. And that seems reasonable if you're on a team, right? You need to be able to know what the other team members are doing. So in healthcare, there's nothing, this is the same thing. But it, this is hard to do too. Especially when you put different professionals in a room, they have to relearn it. That's why for many of you, if you're students, you're in a good place. You can start to learn this now. Because the older we get, it's a little bit harder for us to learn, okay? <laughs> we're really good at it, no, we're not. But it's really important. We need to know what each other's roles and responsibilities are. And, you know, where they wax and wane, where we overlap. Because sometimes we have shared roles and responsibilities, and sometimes they are distinctly different. Okay? But that's a competency, to be able to explain it and work together with a patient. Okay? Another piece, interprofessional communication. Believe it or not, communication has been highly researched. Okay? And especially actually when it relates to teams, it's one of the most essential functions of teams. We know when a good team is going, there's great communication. It's not always verbal. right? Over 90% of communication is nonverbal, but communication is still communication. We need to be able to do this and do it well. And we also know, unfortunately, that a majority of our healthcare mistakes and our patient errors and deaths are due to communication errors. Okay? That's why if anyone's ever been in surgery or seen surgeries before, now they like write things on the leg, this leg cut off. I mean, literally, right? Like big R. Or like, do not cut this leg. They will literally write it down because someone magically won't communicate it's the correct leg, right? And unfortunately, that didn't happen just once, okay? <laughs> this is like thousands of surgery. That person's a leg surgery. Let's not mix them up, okay? These things have occurred, not just in surgery, but for small things too. And we need to make sure that we look at communication and we build that, that within curricula for healthcare, for different types of teams, we look at building real communication. 
and what people don't often realize is that there's actually skills behind communication. It's not I learned a language or I learned to talk. There's actually specific evidence-based ways that we communicate. I'm going to give one example. In healthcare, there's something called SBAR. Okay? It's a very prescriptive, and in nursing, it's the number one form of communication they do, but it's a pres uh, prescriptive evidence-based communication technique. And when that's implemented, 40% of medical errors is reduced just by that one thing, just by communication, by everyone sharing the same way we talk, right? So basically, it's having a common language in healthcare that you use. Because have you ever been around someone and they are of a different profession and they use these words that you have no idea what it means, right? You're like, what? You know? And even something as simple as a laceration. You're like, you mean a cut? Yeah, that's a laceration, right? You know? So even these small terms, okay, we don't often share the same view of what that is. So having a shared communication technique is really essential, okay? SBAR, just to share knowledge, is situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. And so you communicate in very short, succinct sentences a large amount of information that you need to tell that person. And the more you learn it, the more efficient and effective your care delivery is, okay? I'm sure you all know that there's lots of people that have different ways to communicate. Anybody have storytellers? Okay, any, it can even be in that vanilla lot pumpkin, and you're like, disorder, you know, and then they're like, Great. you said that was the right. Definitely folks that have different types of communication, and the training in this is not just about that, it's about how effective the outcomes that links to our satisfaction. And the way they communicated or their energy, you just kind of left and you were like, oh. Anybody ever experienced that? Okay. Or you talk to someone else and you're like, whoa, that's awesome. I'm going to do anything you say. Right? Like me today. You're like, that, that's to it. So learning an evidence-based way to communicate, essential. Another competency. Okay. So hopefully you're seeing, although this is really important, there's some nuances to it. There's some requirements here, right? You can't just jump in and make it happen. The next one is teams and teamwork, okay? It's really hard. You can't just put people together and be like, you're a team, bam, strangers from everywhere, get going, do it, you know? It's hard. It takes time. You actually have to develop teamwork. You have to understand that. You have to have all those essential elements as well that we just talked about. So especially if you're going to work together, okay? Teams and teamwork. So now let's briefly review the other elements of integrated care and how this all works together. There are different levels and level systems to integrated care. In the U.S., they've developed a six-level system. Okay. Oh, do I? My clicker stopped working. So here's the six levels. Okay. And really, these bottom ones, I'm going to go through really quick and strew toward integration. And what we really want to do is get here, the level five and six, ultimately the six. So let's and we've heard it's really awesome of different professions. You know, when I need them, I call them. Let's say, you know what? I actually want to do some real, we need to actually work whenever I needed it. So maybe you're going to be around in the same building. You're going to have a little bit more regular meetings. But you might not actually be seeing the patient together, right? And six. This is where integrated care has the highest level of outcomes, the most effectiveness and efficiency we can have in healthcare. Okay? This in one team. And this is where we say care behavioral health model is at the level six. And this is ultimately where we want your primary care office. I've got my friend Bob in that. So I'm going to bring him in now, and we're going to talk to you together about that. We're diabetes with you to a really important day. Okay? You can't. If you see this, it's almost like her and then you and say, well, we have a, okay, that we, right? We have a behavioral health program here that we use for this or that. Or you can say, we're making a change. Because we know what the evidence says. Okay? All of the studies for over 20 years, especially the World Health Organization study, they say we need to be working in teams. For the most effective and efficient healthcare we can deliver, we need to be doing this. I'm going to turn and say it's not a program anymore. This is our philosophy of healthcare. Okay? To not only help our patient, patient population to be the healthiest they can be, to improve the life of our families and our communities but also to improve our organization, our workforce, their success, okay, their satisfaction to be here. I'm going to go with it's a philosophy. I'm no longer just providing singular provider care and they reach out for a team member. We're doing this together, okay, which means we all are together, meaning we're a team. One person goes down on that team, we all rally together, right? We should be doing that when we think about healthcare with the patient and the community as part of that team too, okay? 
So that's that piece that I always challenge people to think of, is where do you want to go, especially with systems and organizations? Because it takes a lot of planning and a lot of learning to get there, right? So the primary care behavioral health model, just so you can kind of take a look at it really quickly, is a model which incorporates these behavioral health workers, which embody a lot of different types of license types. You might have marriage and family therapists, licensed professional counselors, psychologists. Sometimes people will even say psychiatry. Um, typically, though, it's other mental health practitioners. I've also seen OT, occupational therapists, as part of this team as well, okay? But overall, their scope is wide, okay? They really deal with prevention, accrued and chronic conditions. They see everyone, okay? The ownership of care, it's the PCP. It's a team, okay? It's not solely going in and seeing someone. It's working as a team to be collaborative, okay? There's a lot of high productivity, meaning these teams go in to see anyone. And if you're gonna terminate care, it's because the patient's improving, okay? It's not you're completely resolved and you're a healthy, completely healthy person, okay? It's you're improving, you're doing really well, okay? You're managing your goals, you're meeting your steps. Great, come back when you need us, right? Okay, and we're here for it, okay? So that's what that is. It's really looking at healthcare in a different way as well, okay? So it's the scope of integrated care, especially within PCBH, is pretty wide. So you see, it's everything from individuals with mental health conditions, as we talked about that definition of behavioral health before. It's inclusive of mental health, substance use conditions, but it's also related to chronic disease and comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, asthma, okay? Impairments, okay, distress, headaches, stress-related uh, symptoms, and other health maintenance. I can't tell you, I'm a licensed psychologist, and I've worked in primary care for many years, and I can't tell you how often I've gone into a room to talk to a patient about a flu shot, okay, or do a general health maintenance, and to talk to them about what's maybe preventing them from getting that happen, okay? I'm part of the team, and if that patient's health is going to be improved by doing something that's a general health maintenance behavior, I'm gonna talk to them about it. Right? That's where my role and responsibilities kind of flex a little bit, okay? Especially if another provider needs me to do it and they're running behind, okay? I can have a conversation with that patient too, okay? So that scope is really broad. And what's great is it's about being right there within the medical setting. So within primary care or in some instances in the hospital or in an emergency department, okay? It's right there in general medical health care, okay? Some of the greatest outcomes with integrated care and this teamwork is the quality outcomes, okay? Improved satisfaction, we already talked about that. Improved productivity, which is good and bad, right? Oh man, we get to work more, yes. <laughs> You're much more efficient in what you do, right? So we become better workers, okay? Uh, there's better outcomes related to what we call adherence or compliance, however you might wanna say that, but meaning we were able to bring the patient better into the team. They feel more satisfied that their goals with health are being addressed and they're being more effective with the things that they need to do for themselves, right? So if I actually went in and said, I wanna work on this to take my vitamins, I might actually start taking my vitamins, right? So I might be more effective, right? There's fewer errors, which is huge, okay? There's less, less turnover and burnout, okay? And we have a fiscal return. A lot of times people will say, well, if we work in teams, we're not gonna make any money. We're not gonna be fiscally sound and we're gonna lose money and this, this place is gonna close. Not true, it's a misnomer, okay? Not true. You build it, and you can build it to be fiscally sound with a high return on investment. You just have to take the time to build it and build it correctly. That's the problem that we miss, is we throw people together, and we don't do any of the systematic changes that are needed to make that team run effectively and efficiently, okay? Let's look at some other outcomes. So look at healthcare outcomes. All of these are healthcare outcomes that have improved, improved significantly with PCBH, with a team-based approach to healthcare. Okay? So it's not just one area, it's not one thing that improves, okay? it's most areas. Okay? On top of that, we have outcomes related to our healthcare system. Reduced specialist utilization, lower ED or emergency department utilization, hospital admissions, cost per patient, and improved cost savings, okay? just improved satisfaction. We have all of these that increase with doing team-based PCBH care. So thinking about this, wouldn't you want this in your healthcare, right? So there's lots of outcomes related to PCBH in specific, even recognizing that people are getting better faster. And part of that is because they're using evidence-based techniques. 
And believe it or not, in medicine and in behavioral health care and social sciences, we don't always use evidence-based interventions and techniques, okay? Has anybody ever had difficulty sleeping in their life, okay? <laughs> Has anybody ever been, had, had a recommendation of, oh, just take a medication to go to sleep, right? right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are like, yes, yes, right, right. Okay, or some other thing. Well, we really should be looking at, right, sleep hygiene, right? Well, are we watching TV? Did we just drink a Coke or a Mountain Dew before we went to sleep? Well, yeah, but <laughs> right. we really should do other evidence-based interventions before we do medication or other things, okay? Other things that could potentially hurt our health even more by doing them. But when you go in to see doctors, physicians, uh, medical providers of other kinds, even folk like myself that are licensed in mental health, we don't often always go and use evidence-based techniques even though they're more efficient and effective. Sometimes it's because we lack the training in it. We just don't know it, okay? PTSD is actually fully resolvable with very specific evidence-based treatment, okay? But yet, a lot of people think you have to have it for the rest of your life and you can't treat it, okay? Within three to four sessions, it's completely resolvable with some types of evidence-based treatment, right? So this goes through. So we have to recognize within these models, you have to use specific evidence-based interventions to get the outcomes you want. So what we're talking about is building that team structure with those core competencies, right? Not only the team-based competencies that we talked about, but also the competencies within our own practice, okay? The evidence-based intervention. Other elements of PCBH, just to kind of go through it, as you see, we have this population health focus, okay? We wanna think about the health of our population communities. What do we target as larger look at social determinants of health, okay? What are people struggling with in these areas, okay? We might do screening tools or huddles where we have general and specific communication as teams together in specific times we do it. There's a lot of different essential elements to integrated care. All of those elements take time and training to do, okay? And to do it well. But survival of the fittest. <laughs> Not all integrated care, if you don't do it well, is going to survive. We have to really make a business case and operationalize our training, not only at the general education level, as you all may be if you're new students, on up, but also at that training level for all of us who are licensed clinicians and professionals. We have to be able to know, why are we doing this? What are our quadruple aims, okay? What is the data that we're trying to improve? What outcomes? How are we defining that team? I can't tell you how often I'll get teams of people together at integrated care sites, and they don't even have the same definition of integrated care. Some of them are, remember that level system? Some of them think they're in one, and some of them think they're in six. And they're like, well, you're at the same system. <laughs> but you think you're in level one, you think you're level six, that's a huge difference, right? So we really need to be on the same page, okay? And that takes a lot of that strategic operatization that needs to take place, okay? So part of doing this, you need to assess needs, you need to identify strengths, you need to complete plans, you need to develop it, okay, and move forward. This is more of that business outcome pl place. There's very specific evidence-based assessment tools that you can actually utilize when you're putting teams together and when you're going to place integrated care. So just like within ourselves, we can do brief assessments or questionnaires for ourselves to improve ourselves, right? There's very specific types of questionnaires that people can do to improve and look at how we're operating as a team and barriers to that as well so we can make improvements. Okay. So we need to do standardization. Keep calm and make those SMART goals, okay? Right, SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, right? The world's gonna be perfect, not a good goal, not a good goal, right? So realistic and time bound, that's SMART. So when we think about these things and making these changes, we need to be thinking about systematic SMART changes at the organizational level. And that's where that comes with those fiscal folks, you know, those uh, healthcare management folks, the administrators. We need to have them all involved in this. So what we talk about is making top-down and bottom-up changes, right? So executive level changes and acceptance that this is a philosophy of healthcare we're, we're changing toward. And then bottom-up, right? So medical records, physicians, all your healthcare providers, everyone going all the way up the ladder also believe in it too. And we're all gonna make these changes together. In outcomes for teamwork and PCBH, you have operational, fiscal, and quality outcomes. They can range a variety of different data points and data metrics. This is where your EMRs come in, your electronic health records, your medical records will come in a lot. 
But there's so many things that you can change, and you can register. You can monitor every month, week, day, year to make sure that you're doing the quality improvements you need. Okay? You need to have that return on investment. Okay? Certainly in money and finances, et cetera, but you need to name it. What's the return on investment for our patients, for providers, for our team, the organization, the community, fiscally? You might have different answers for all of them, but we need to know it. We need to ask it, and we need to build that into our philosophy of care. Okay? It's also really important to recognize that how we're moving in healthcare is toward this quality improvement model, not only related to how we want to improve the quality and outcomes of our patients, but also in how we're getting paid in return. We've been a fee-for-service model for so long, and in most ways we still are, meaning you come in for a service, you pay a fee, okay? But unfortunately, what we've recognized in healthcare and through many, many studies is you might pay that fee, but the service you receive here may be completely different and substandard than the service you receive here, okay? It also may be you receive a service here and you don't get any of the outcomes that are related to that service. Does this make sense? Okay. And if you pay a fee, you should have good quality service and get good outcomes. So that's where quality payment systems come in. It's actually a way that we monitor now healthcare services and the outcomes that happen. So now we say, partially, okay, that a percentage of your payment for certain populations right now in the U.S. is actually given to you only if you meet quality outcomes. That makes sense. You get paid and you get paid a little bit more if you're actually doing a good job, okay? Because before you could do a lousy job and still get paid the same, right? I'm sure you all have experienced that or know people who have, okay? Yeah? So now we have this. And a lot of the factors that they're doing and, and banking quality improvements on are behavioral factors. You read this list and you see just a physician doesn't need to do that. Any member of the healthcare team could actually make changes and help people to make this happen, okay? The next element of quality reimbursement and money, 15% comes from this, purely. What, did you see that? That's PCBH. Are we talking about that? What? Okay, so purely from adding that in, you also get additional money. So not only are we looking at and we see the benefits of this, but healthcare system in the whole, when it comes to where we're moving toward quality reimbursement and changes, it's saying we need to be doing this too, okay? So we're grounded in all of this to do it. Again, can't do anything without really systematically changing it and putting it into management side. I'm much more of a management side oriented person, so I could probably talk about this forever, which would probably bore you, okay? But you get some good sleep, but we won't do it today. <laughs> but it's important to always be able to recognize that when you want to make a change, it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of planning to make sure it's done effectively and efficiently in healthcare, okay? So there's a lot of education and training I want you all to think about. I want you to think about how you might want to expand your education, how you might want to expand your training to these very areas we talked about today. You might want to challenge the professors to even think a little bit more broadly, maybe interdisciplinary, taking classes from different areas, okay? Working together collaboratively, really taking a different view of even a patient perspective. Okay, how do we do all these things? Okay. Diversify our instruction. Okay. My hope is that by hearing this today, you might walk away with a different perspective of how you might deliver healthcare or how you might want to receive healthcare in the future. Whether you're someone that's gonna go out and deliver it and learn it, or whether or not you're just someone who's going to receive healthcare, you should have a broader expectation of the outcomes you wanna receive and how you want to receive that in healthcare. And I want you to think about this team-based perspective. The more we request it as patients, and the more we request it as learners and as professionals to build our training, the better outcomes we're all gonna have, okay? So I wanna take this time right now to ask you all if you have any questions related to the PCBH model, to integration, to any of these elements that I talked about today. So I think we have about five or so minutes does anybody have any questions? You know, you answered everything. It was awesome. Oh, wow. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any questions for anyone? Oh, oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a great question. So we don't know the actual percentage of that are using um, an integrated system in the US. We do not have an actual good stat on that. Um, but my prediction is probably about 10% <laughs> currently. When you think about healthcare systems, there's actually mandates to integrate. So you will see integration at a larger sense than about 50% of our healthcare systems. So anyone who has a patient-centered medical home typically is between the level one and level six of integration. So that's really wide, right? Meaning they could be talking to people and consulting and still hit that level, or they could be fully talking to you as a team, okay? So level one, there's a lot of those around, right? Okay. So anyone that's a patient-centered medical home, VA systems, Veterans Administration systems, most of them are moving toward full integration, okay? It takes a long time to get there. Um, so Native Health, Indian Health Services, that also has a mandate toward integration. They're moving there. It takes time, okay? NHSC sites, so National Health Service core sites throughout the U.S. and federally qualified health centers across the U.S. also are recommending and encouraged toward it as well. And they have funding support to do it, wraparound uh, payment models. So a lot of those have already transitioned or are transitioning. So all of your government entities, as far as your U.S. military, your Department of Defense, all of those services are also in already established as integrated models. They might be on the spectrum of that level system, but all of them are required to be integrated as well. Okay? So there's a lot of larger scale entities that are doing it. Also places like ACOs, accountable care organizations. They're built on models where different professionals and entities get together to build healthcare, okay, and a large healthcare organization. But again, they may be more on the lower end of a spectrum than on really the PCBH model. Okay, so you're going to see really the full, I would say about 20 years ago, this was something that people would talk about and be like, what, did you just hear, well, I've never heard of that, right? And now at most healthcare sites, they'll say, yeah, I've heard of it, we've been wanting to do it. We just haven't figured out how to do it yet, okay? So it's growing. I would say in the private sector, most um, private organizations and private medical health centers, so mom and pop docs is what sometimes will be nicknamed, they're usually going and folding into ACOs, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to, want to look at that, meaning they're being swallowed up by larger organizations now. So there's fewer and fewer smaller docs that are out there. Um, how insurance companies are incentivizing it is they're actually, if you work with them, you can get different types of bundled payments. So you can sometimes get a larger payment by being able to provide a larger amount of care in your organization, or they might be, allow you to do dual payment services, meaning double payment for the same patient on the same day. Um, and at the same time, some of those insurance companies are actually have requirements to manage different elements of, of patients that have chronic or comorbid conditions. So the insurance companies actually take on a lot of responsibility, believe it or not, okay? You might not see it, but they own the responsibility. So if you're a mom and pop doc, if you're a smaller doc shop, what you need to do is reach out to them and say, what are you doing for these patients who have chronic comorbid conditions? What do you have available? And oftentimes they actually have their own behavioral health providers that are at call centers or telehealth centers, and they can link them to that doc shop. And they actually will do a call in line or they'll take, you have to run panels of patients and turn them over, and they will start calling those patients every week or every day to help them to get the health that they need. So if you say, this patient needs to take their medication or this patient needs to do X, Y, and Z or do this exercise five times, those individuals will actually call those patients to help them to get their healthcare needs met. Um, now, it still doesn't mean that everyone has access to that. When those insurance companies have it, it's for very specific populations only. So unfortunately, the insurance companies may not have programs that will meet everyone's needs. Um, however, I will put a note in for mom and pop doc shops. Again, I'm just speaking the smaller doc shops. Those shops can be fiscally solvent and sound by bringing on a behavioral health provider onto their healthcare team. And there's actually already return on investment metrics and some studies done on small one to two doc organizations and operations that brought on another interprofessional team member and was able to make that fiscally solvent. Okay? So they had a fiscal return on investment, not just a return on investment for the patient meaning it wasn't just satisfaction for themselves or for the patient and great outcomes, they actually made money doing it too, okay? The meaning they could pay for that other person and keep the doors open, okay? Yep, 100%. So um, 
transportation needs, um, other types of addressing of other social determinants of health, food access, um, you know, food desert concerns, et cetera. You're going to look at more of your federally qualified health centers, um, sometimes Indian health services. But more of the federally qualified health centers, they will run a lot of programs that have that, that actually incorporate it or what they do, um, uh, homeless shelters and organizations, they will, homeless or houseless, depending on what organization you work with, they will actually send mobile medical out to individuals to help them get the access they need. Okay? So we do have that. It's growing. It's still very small. It's probably less than the 10% that, that have it, um, but it is there. Okay. Here, I can't speak to what's here locally, uh, but it does exist in other places. Yeah. Big issue. I do say that in my own healthcare centers and in other healthcare centers across the U.S., people have to think strategically and creatively to get the money. Um, I've actually seen and helped other healthcare organizations that got the money for a van, a mobile van, donated by the SNAP organization. SNAP is um, your food stamps organization for the state. They donated the money to it because the money wasn't, if the money's not utilized every year, right, their funds are cut, so they get less funds. So trust me, they want that money used, right, because that means part of them may die, right? So they want the money used, and what they recognized was in a certain area, every year less and less of the money was being used, but they still had a huge overwhelming need. So people weren't going in who were qualified for SNAP we're not receiving the funds. So SNAP actually funded the mobile medical van so that during when we went out to provide medical services, we provided SNAP applications. Does that make sense? So we said, okay, we can do this and you're gonna receive this. So there's creative ways sometimes people can obtain that. It's still difficult and it's still very limited. Right? I think so. If not, I'm more than happy to send them. And I have uh, the references as well and any articles that people might want as well. If you've signed up, we should be able to email it to you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. I wanted to thank all of you for coming, and I also wanted to thank Dr. Manson for being here. I don't know if you guys realized what you just heard today is a A to Z of a, like it's obviously it's at a 30,000 foot level view of what it looks like to think about why we need integrated care to the dark areas of what we call the integrated care of the fiscal uh, you know, sustainability and other things that people are often going through a lot of struggles to figure it out, right? So as you guys go back, those of you who are students, I want you to really think about some of the subject matters that you're studying and where your careers are headed and see all the different windows that just opened up during this talk and to think about where do I fit in. And then two, as you guys go back and become patients again, when you go back to your healthcare providers, think about your visit. Think about when you walk into the door and when you come out, what you experience. And you do have the right to demand more from your healthcare system and your healthcare providers. And the future of healthcare has to be an integrated model. So I hope all of you would think about that and be part of that as patients and as future providers. Thank you so much. We have our next set of series that are coming uh, in the future. It takes me a little bit. There, there we go. No, it's still going. Oh, is it okay? I talked for a long time. What's going on? Okay, so we'll, ha we'll have a talk in, uh, in two talks in the fall, uh, in the spring. So we have one in January and one in March that will be focused more on health policy related to integrated care and all the uh, things that are being done to influence policy level decisions. So I hope you guys will join us. Thank you so much. <laughs>